Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to DIA. Um, thank you all for, for coming out today for the book launch for our newest publication, Puerto Rican Light, Cueva Vientos. Um, we're here. This is um, very fortuitous timing. This also happens to be the, the first anniversary of the opening of the installation Cueva Vientos um, in Puerto Rico. And we're honored today to have um, the artists as well as uh, the curator of the project, Yasmil Raymond, and um, author Molly Nesbitt, who are going to talk about the book today. Um, if I can just, uh, a couple of notes before we begin. Um, this is our first um, program of the fall season, uh, but we are continuing this coming Tuesday. We will be having our first uh, reading in contemporary poetry for the fall with uh, Meme Bersenbrugge and Richard Tuttle. Uh, that's on September 20th, and on September 27th will be our first Artists on Artists lecture, and, and that will be Andrea Bowers on Martha Rossler. Um, I'd like to um, thank a couple of people for um, making this publication possible. Um, the generous funding for the publication was provided by via Art Fund. Um, we'd like to thank them. And additional support was provided by Gladstone Gallery New York uh, in Brussels, Kermanzutu Mexico City, and Listen Gallery London and Milan. And um, we'd also like to thank Brooklyn Brewery for today's beverages. Um, <laughs> so if I can introduce our, our speakers today, I'll um, start with um, on the end here. Uh, Jasmine Raymond is an associate curator in the Department of Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art, New York. Previously, she was curator at Dia Art Foundation, um, where she organized the commission of Jennifer Laura and Guillermo Calzadilla's Puerto Rican Light Cueva Vientos uh, with assistant curator Manuel Sirauqui. While at Dia from 2009 to 2015, Raymond also organized commissions and exhibitions, including Carl Andre, Sculpture's Place, 1958 to 2010, in 2014 to 15, Thomas Hirschhorn's Gramsci Monument in 2013, Jean-Luc Jean Moulin, Opus Plus One, uh, 2011 to 12, Robert Whitman's Passport, 2011, and Franz Erhardt Walter, Work as Action, 2010 to 12. Um, Molly Nesbitt is a professor of art history in the Department of Art at Vassar College, Poughkeepsie, New York, and a contributing editor at Art Forum. Her books include Agit's Seven Albums and Their Common Sense. Um, the Pragmatism in the History of Art, 2013, is the first volume of Preoccupations, a collection of Nesbitt's essays. Since 2002, together with Hansel Rogobrist and Rirke Teravinia, she has curated Utopia Station, an ongoing collective book, exhibition, seminar, website, and street project. Uh, collaborating since 1995, Jennifer Alora and Guillermo Calzadilla reclaim and transform the objects of contemporary life to create video installations, sculptures, performances, and photographic works that alter established views of reality. A striking characteristic of the artist's creative output lies in their tendency to construct meaning through an unorthodox investment in research. The itinerant interests which guide their practice unite the work of art with narratives of knowledge production, experimentation, and invention. Alora and Calzadilla's work has been featured in solo exhibitions at a range of international venues, including most recently the Philadelphia Museum of Art, 2014, the Trussardi Foundation Milan, 2013, Indianapolis Museum of Art, 2012, the U.S. Pavilion at the 54th Venice Biennale, 2011, and Museum of Modern Art, New York, 2010, among others. Their collaborative work has also been featured in various group exhibitions, such as Documenta 13, in Castle, 2012, the 5th, 7th, and 10th Gwangju Biennales, South Korea, and the 24th and 29th Sao Paulo Biennials. Alora and Calzadilla live and work in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And, uh, Please join me in giving them all um, a warm round of applause and welcome. Thank you. I feel like um, we should also applaud all of you for being here today. It's a beautiful day. Um, I know there's a lot of events happening in New York with the PS1 Book Fair 
and also um, an artist space, the Decolonize um, this place series, which is one of the reasons why one of our authors, Jade McKee, could not be here with us. So, But Molly was able to sneak a few hours with us, even though she's running there afterwards to initiate this um, second conversation and hopefully a lot of debate. So we're very excited um, for our sister uh, institution, Art Space, our friends there. Um, I also feel very humbled um, to have um, just met one of another author in our book, Espiros Papapetros, who's here with us in the front row, so maybe later we can move a chair and join the table if things get heated. Um, and also I'm delighted that Juan Lopez Bausa, another of the authors of the book, is here from Puerto Rico, and um, he was instrumental to the fact that this book is a bilingual book. And when you hold it, it looks a bit strange. The cover is repeated upside down on the back, and it's not a bad design. On the contrary, Laura Field, Diaz designer, it's very smart, and she's here with us. So thank you, Laura. Uh, the book, you have to turn it to read the Spanish version, um, the English version, the other way. Um, this is the first bilingual book in Diaz's uh, series of books over the years. Um, and we're very proud of this, because Puerto Rico is a bilingual place. And um, the title of the book, Puerto Rican Light, Cueva Vientos, is um, really telling to uh, enormous preoccupation that has been in the work of Guillermo and Jennifer for many years. And I thought that to open up the conversation to ask them to tell us what is it that we were seeing when you walk in, because the space was dark and it was playing a sound piece in particular and, uh, and, and a video. Um, so let's start there. What, 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 can you share a little bit of what um, that decision was about? Well, it was, it's not a work, it was just material that we had accumulated. So you're seeing basically uh, uh, the cave main vault or gallery has an oculus, which is this aperture, and the light of the sun comes in, and it makes, it moves around the, the space, and it turns it into a sundial, basically. So there's this cosmic quality to, to the space. Then the sound you're listening to is the original uh, Puerto Rican light to Ginny Blake from 1965 work. We uh, took it to a recording studio and recorded the sound of the bulbs. So there's, uh, you're hearing the, the different bulbs, the red, the pink, and the yellow being sort of uh, scanned sonically, and that's the sound you're hearing. Which it's just to be a B flat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we thought that since many, so many of you probably haven't had a chance to go to see the project, um, to, to bring an element of what is happening there, right? Mm -hmm. And then in the background now, I believe, are just some stills that are reproduced in this book, just to give you a sense of um, the other aspect of the experience of the work is the journey um, to the site. And so these are just different photographs of the, um, the surrounding um, natural reserve and the flora and fauna and the interior of the cave. And also a little, there's a few photographs of prior to getting to the site where the work is located, um, some of the other larger urban uh, contexts, so the, you, the, some of the images of the petrochemical company that was abandoned in the 1970s are also presented there, showing um, other ways in which this area had been uh, also used for energy production and its role in the history of light in Puerto Rico, basically. So this is a book lounge, even though we would want to make it into a project conversation too, but we'll try to keep that balance. But um, when we were debating about how to do a book launch, uh, I was asked to explain what the book is about or how the book came into existence. And as you will see, this is not a catalog. Um, this was a decision that early on you guys uh, instructed me to guard the possibility of this book becoming a reference book, an anthology. We discussed this uh, extensively um, and there was a list of names that immediately came together of authors that you said that you were fascinated by that you uh, were curious about interested in and that we needed to 
ask, we wanted to ask them if they would write for this book. And I remember we were very shy because most of the authors were not art world people. So when you look at the table of contents, um, it's only Molly and Jates and me. <laughs> and the rest is operating in multiple fields at the same time with affinities with art or desires or uh, observations about art, but not particularly art historians or curators or um, art theorists, right? Can we talk a little bit about that motivation? What, do you, what was it that drove this desire for, what was lacking? What do you think was lacking um, in the field or in, in the books that we are surrounded by that m made you say to us, well, please invite Kalevi Kuhl or Emma Stone? Well, I think uh, for, from speaking for myself, um, you know, in, like was mentioned at the outset, like investigation is a big part of how we how we work because we collaborate together. We're constantly working with ideas, and um, so that obviously opens up to a conversation with other kinds of ideas that are found in in books and in research, and so um, that informs deeply our our way of working. And we wanted to make a book that also in that spirit of of a kind of as. Bifo Berardi mentions a kind of creative community we wanted to create around this project in which um, ideas can be shared uh, and that the book becomes a resource um, not only to know a little bit about our own interests and why we came about making this work but that it becomes a toolbox for others to make other things with and to share um, you know, the, that process and make it an ongoing uh, situation. And this was something that the second part of this um, editorial team, apart from Stephen and Laura here at DIA, there was um, Manuel Sirauki, who cannot be with us today because now he lives in Bilbao, in Spain. But he was really a um, key figure on understanding the how to start linking the interests of several of these authors. And obviously, for those of you who are artists and are constantly thinking about how to make a book about your work, this was also a very uh, delicate balance because we wanted to guide, or if we felt that the author was leaning towards um, describing your work when they wrote their contribution, we wanted to make sure that that was not the focus, that we were not asking someone like Timothy Morton to write about the work of Guillermo and Jennifer. So this was one of the parameters of the invitation was that to try to keep everybody on the, within their field. Um, the, the special exception always to these kind of rules is Molly Nesbitt, who immediately, when we invited her, she accepted this modest invitation. And um, I thought it was obvious to us. We always wanted Molly to write about your work. We always talked about her name. We knew that, um, was a, it was going to happen, it was bound to happen. And when we sent the invitation and Molly enthusiastically accepted, immediately you, you I remember you saying, I have ideas, I'm, I'm ready. And then what happened? Tell us a little bit about that invitation and the result of the text, the beautiful text you present to us in this book. I mean, um, texts evolve, but what I will say is that the, um, the invitation appealed to me a lot because it had a lot to do with the kinds of uh, conversations we'd already been having without a project in mind. Um, we, I think I had my first conversations with you at the Gramsci Monument, really, right? Yeah, probably. Many. Yeah. <laughs> um, and our first conversations were in Senegal, no? In wow. Dakar, at the mm -hmm. Dakar Biennial and where we'd all converged and Jennifer and Guillermo had a piece in a video section mm -hmm. right, of the Dakar Biennial and we, anyway, we talked. But the idea really with these conversations is that they're not, uh, you know, sort of enclosed specialist conversations. There's a side of the art world which is, looks outward and, you know, we all belong to that side of it and the fourth wall drops away and, you know, other things go in and out and around, and it's a very open, expanding situation in which, in which people have roles but not really defined ones. And increasingly, I've realized that I don't really want to write what used to be called art criticism um, because it's too narrow a brief. 
And um, so with my friends Jennifer and Guillermo, I, there was no question that I was not being asked to write art criticism. Um, you know, our conversations had a lot to do with Utopia. They had a lot to do with, because of Utopia Station, which they've also worked with. And, uh, but they had, um, I don't know, they, they, they just went laterally, however they did. Um, and I'd always thought, you know, that it would be good to find a way of writing and taking the kind of writing one does art historically and sort of expand the time code and use that expanded time code to write about things that we're all talking about now. And so, uh, when I got the phone call saying, what do you think? I was writing about Kubler for my pragmatism mm -hmm. book. And I thought, hmm, Puerto Rican light, that, you know, a lighthouse beckons. Uh, I can work with that, but not having a big idea about what. But I knew that as the material grew and, um, and our conversations then had a reason to keep going, which is also part of the pleasure of this way of working, that I would be able to do field work. So I was pretty clear immediately about needing to go to Puerto Rico. Yeah. And um, so I did. I went before the piece had been installed. In fact, I don't think I saw Puerto Rican Light. That installed? I didn't no. see it, certainly didn't see it installed. I don't think I ever really saw it, you know, yeah. as a yeah. work. Yeah. But I also yes. thought, you know, I come with a skill set. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody needs to write about 1965. Yeah. It's an expanded time code, right? Yeah. Um, and so I started there, not quite realizing that that was the place in the time when Dan Flavin and Robert Smithson started talking to, you know, uncertain ends. We'll just, I don't want to give the whole thing away. Um, but uh, that Puerto Rican light, in fact, gets mixed up in that conversation too. And uh, it keeps going. Um, so, you know, historians are storytellers, so I contributed some stories um, of the, the truthful variety. Uh, and it keeps going. Next weekend, I'm going to go to the cave and see, see and hear. And experience it, yeah. And smell. And smell. Mm -hmm. and um, but it's big and green and dark, mm -hmm. the cave. It's really pretty magical mm -hmm. and uh, wild. You know, it's a little further down the hill, there's a bat cave. With thousands of bats, but this cave doesn't have so many not so many bats. Occasion, no, the occasional flyby. Yeah. <laughs> if people are afraid of them, we can. Yeah, <laughs> but it is deeply there. impure as a situation. Except, I suppose you could say that the light conditions are pure mm -hmm. and changeable. And maybe we should mm -hmm. say more about that because. Um, it's not often that a work of art gets wrapped into the cycles of the day mm -hmm. and the seasons quite like this. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you had probably, a, they have a great library. And it's not just, you know, research that goes in a drawer and the drawer closes. I have a feeling that this was also a way for you to activate some thinking you'd already been doing about Smithson and so yeah. on. And, and you know, mm -hmm. and to put a cave into the mix and Dia. Yeah, all those pieces. Right. I mean, to talk about the origins of the work, it, certainly of the work, this Dia project is uh, certainly, like when we, many years ago, like maybe nine years ago, I guess it was already, it was Philippe Verne who had invited us to do something with Dia. And um, at the time, um, you know, the building here was already closed on 22nd Street. and. And we went up to Beacon, I think, yeah. once or twice, and then they were doing some projects at the Hispanic uh, so so society. society, and yeah. we went there, and we looked yeah. at it, but we didn't we feel like any of that was right. Um, and then we just started thinking about the history, of course, of the institution, and, and yeah. our, our attractions immediately were drawn to those off-site projects that uh, Dia is endowed with, you know, uh, maintaining, and, and that whole history was, for us, very obvious, the, the place that we wanted to connect with. and. Uh, and then further investigating, um, we found out that, that this piece by Dan Flavin is in the, the collection of Dia. And we just 
you know, we're very pleased by that coincidence. But you should also say you'd already worked with Puerto Rican light. Yeah, we yeah. worked with another version of it. So, it was, I mean, you know, as a, yeah, the, that, that name, that word, and I think this whole book, a lot of what's in this book is about the question of, uh, again, like sign processes and, and mm -hmm. how to make meaning and how meaning is made. Um, through different um, systems of thinking from scientific and biological evolutionary standpoints to the way meaning is made in, in art and other things. Yeah, fields. and maybe for the purpose of, of the audience who don't know, or I hope maybe you do know, but um, just in case someone just came into this uh, conversation without some background, the work that um, Molly and, and Jennifer are describing is Dan Flavin's 1965 sculpture. It's an edition work. There are five of each of two different sizes. It's a three-lamp sculpture, and it's called Puerto Rican Light to Jenny Blake. And this work, um, one of the editions of this work, is in the collection of the DR Foundation. There are others in other collections around the world, including the Panza collection that went to, I believe now, to Magba. This work is in the collection of Magba. Or it was, and then it went somewhere else. So it's, it's a work that exists in multiple collections, so it's not just the one at DIA. Mm -hmm. And in 19, when, when was it, 2000? 2003. 2003, at the America Society, you were invited for a solo exhibition by Sofia Hernandez Schoen, mm -hmm. and you installed the first version of this work, just simply called Perican Light. And the book and the project at DIA is based on a second version of this project, of this piece, um, and has a subtitle in parentheses, Cueva Vientos, which means the cave of the wings, is the name of the cave in which the work is installed today. In order to um, light this work, you had to devise a whole system of, of displacement. Do you want to just briefly describe it so that um, everybody understands how there's electricity in a cave? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I mean, um, electricity was, I think, one of the foremost interests or obvious things that came out to us. Like, the work needs to be plugged into the electrical uh, plug of the gallery or the museum that, that expands to the electrical uh, network of the city, and it keeps growing, the industries of electricity within continents, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and uh, that actually uh, got us to think about the uneven uh, structure and development of electricity throughout the world itself. And speaking of the book, there's uh, one of the texts by Jates, actually. Uh, it's called uh, Cave Art and Climate Debt. Geopolitics of Puerto Rican light, uh, something like that. He actually mentions uh, a concept of that kind of, I think it was a good uh, adhesive to start joining things together. I think it uh, talks about climate debt as a, as a concept that refutes the idea that, this is quote, Jace, that the contemporary climate crisis is a problem for which humanity in general bears responsibility, focusing, focusing instead on the historic debt owned by the global north to the south. The fact that electricity is an unevenly distributed infrastructure imbricated with colonial and post-colonial dynamics. So electricity itself became, uh, to, to a certain point, like a big you know, a thing you know, that let us make connections. And so the way that the, the space where the work is installed, there's no electricity at all on the area. So we install a series of solar panels that uh, gather sunlight transfer into energy and uh, power the fluorescent bulbs in this space that predates human presence on the planet. The cave itself is 65 million years old and it's not something that is, it doesn't have a finitude, it's not done. The walls keep growing, the ceiling keeps you know, developing, the floor is changing, so it's the space that itself is changing constantly. And it feels like a time capsule when you're in the space because, like I mentioned earlier, there's this oculus that lets the light of the sunlight come at noon and then it moves around and it dances around. There's this play between artificial light, which is this 20th century art object that is illuminating this 65 million years formation, but then something... Uh, this area is extremely uh, rich with uh, different ecosystems and uh, one of the things that is very 
uh, interesting is that it has one of the lowest cloud formations. So when the clouds pass over the, the roof of the cave, it plunges completely into darkness, the cave. And then you only see everything through this object, these fluorescent bulbs, but then slowly mm -hmm. they pass away and then illuminates the cave. So you see time pass and it becomes very, uh, it feels like you're watching time through life moving. It feels like, I mean, you think obviously about camera obscura and like cinema and, you know, and all those things. And then at 3 p.m., when the sun is slowly moving, then the light comes from the main entrance. So it feels like there's three different thresholds. There's the first threshold is the opening of the cave that is 200 feet tall, so it's extremely grand, you're walking up. Then the main vault of the gallery has the other threshold, which is the oculus, that is 250 feet tall. And the third threshold would be the fluorescent bulbs. So you have this sort of play between these different light, light sources, light sources moving and changing. And I also just want to add, thinking parallel, and this is I think the nature of our collaboration and why a book like this is the only kind of book we really could do that reflects our collaboration. Is while he was saying that, I was thinking about how important to us uh, the Curse Share by George Bataille has always been as a reference point, and how the sun as this ultimate uh, source of an economy in which we're all indebted to, all life forms are indebted to this endless flow of, which of you know, energy matter coming from the sun. And that notion too somehow was informing to what we were thinking about when we were devising this project. And something that Mick Tausick hits at in his contribution yeah. to the book. In going back to the, to the cave, uh, we were, uh, immediately I thought of um, Kalevi's new cool essay about ecosymiotics and what we were dis discussing earlier together on, on how she described the relationship we humans have to, to trash. Tell me, t t tell us a little bit about how we, we arrived to her or how, how you arrived, how we arrived to her writings and what was motivating us. I mean, I remember we were all invested in reading yeah. several things before we invited and her and um, it was incredible, um, the contribution. Absolutely, I mean, that we, and another, I mean, also this work doesn't just come out of a vacuum of, our, of nowhere, it evolved within our larger practice and other works that we had been making around, you know, over the last, 15 years or so, and one of the subjects that we've been increasingly more interested in, it started with uh, an interest in the, like, the history and of the political forms of music and how music works and the social force of music, which then led us into an investigation of the relationship between music and language and then the origins of those in the human uh, evolution, which then led us into the larger question of, uh, you know, the huma human within the larger field of living systems and life forms themselves, which brought us then into the space of um, sign systems. And there's this new camp, uh, or new field, I should say, of, uh, of investigation within many different fields, from neuroscience to evolutionary biology to other um, research areas, which they call biosemiotics. And in that, I had, we bought like two or three anthologies yeah, of books. I remember books we were in Puerto Rico reading. Showing you on this subject yeah. matter. And, and in there, they rediscovered you would, I'm sure, know is a Pyrrhus is a very important uh, person for, for them in uh, trying to understand and use uh, the Persian model as a way to understand evolution and how sign systems work. So all of this was just all um, really rich territory for us that we were interested in, in knowing, knowing more about and we thought that this project somehow was opening itself towards those kinds of questions and investigations and so we thought it'd be great to in fact approach somebody who is deeply immersed in that field to contribute uh, a piece of writing and so the quote the, about what you just asked about which I we were talking about which is fast which I love is he, they say the biosphere consists of matter that is produced by life, whereas the noosphere, which is the sphere uh, that humans only um, make, or a symbolic people, producers, which are only humans, consists of matter that is the product of symbol use, that is, of human culture. A notable difference is that while almost everything produced by non-humans is edible to some creatures, the manipulative capacity of symbol users has resulted in the products, the production of materials that no being, not even fungi or bacteria, can consume. So I love this idea that, you know, 
this idea of, uh, you know, us symbol makers have, um, with all of this uh, great imagination and, and uh, capacity to, to do things with our symbolic potential, we also have obviously, and this is what we're living through right now in what he's talking about, the climate debt and all of this, is we have been the ones through our symbolic practices to create it something that cannot obviously be um, digested by the rest of the, you know, uh, non-human living world that we all inhabit. And, and the problem that we symbolic um, animals have created for ourselves as a result of that. And, and this is something that seems to go back and forth between, I mean, for me, it was something that I had in mind when we were doing this gesture of reintroducing a work of art by another artist who's not living anymore and bringing it into the context of living nature, organic world, um, we had to hire a biologist to spend time there and to you remember the report of the cave, um, of the, what, what was living there, what are, were the insects living there, what were the cockroaches, the type of bats, the different type of mice that live in the cave, the cat that it lives in the cave. And, um, and I was thinking of Molly when, you're, when you were writing and you quoted Tatlin and the, the real materials in real space and um, all of a sudden it, how it made us humble being in, this, in the context of, of these materials that are not usually associated with the experience of art. Even the journey when you arrive to the cave that we, you have to walk through this landscape, very different landscape to lead you there. Um, was something about that experience informing to your thinking when you were conceiving the essay um, for the book? Was there, why did you go, I mean, Flavin was very fun, fond of, of tattling. I think that's probably, yeah. <laughs> this is um, one of the reasons. So you, in your essay, you tried to stay close to Flavin more than, right, than Porican Light. Well, you know what I was... Uh, in Casadilla. Well, Partly because, you know, Flavin, at that point in his work, was, in his way, trying to open out to reality. And, you know, his work goes through different phases. But at this particular moment, it was pretty open. And it, the only um, reason it had this particular piece has that particular title is not because he was thinking about Puerto Rico, but because the piece arrived in the gallery and they needed to name it. And the gallery assistant, Jeannie Blake, um, had just been to the Puerto Rican Day Parade and the colors reminded her of the parade. And so it's a liberation moment, you know, a, in Puerto Rican uh, community life and politics in New York City and boom, it goes, you know, all of that is allowed to go into, you know, in, a, in color code into Flavin's work. In and, color code. And mm -hmm. yeah, and it, but what's also interesting for me, and I haven't seen it in the cave yet, is to know, is, is Flavin's work enlarged by this experience of being out in nature with, you know, stripped of all its usual, you know, sort of spatial I think uh, so. I would argue yes, obviously. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, yeah, but, I it, so. but it puts a lot of pressure on a work of art to go into this natural vault. I mean, it's, you know, it's like a cathedral bay. Well, it puts a lot, of, a, a lot of pressure on their work of art. Yeah. Because I think what also happened when, when I was reading, both. yeah, there, there are, there's a collaboration that is a non... Um, Discreet collaboration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a kidnapping in a way, right? It's a, yeah, it's a non... It's a productive collaboration through a certain insertion of a, of a decision-making, right, from their part. And, and I remember when I was thinking of my contribution, that that was the big dance that I wanted to deliver, that in, in their work, they're presenting a new definition of what it means to reinsert the ready-made, and a, and a highlighted ready-made, and an enhanced, expanded ready-made that we are yet to dismantle. I mean, it's a proposition, it's a new proposition that they're bringing us. It's like a double ready-made. Well, it's, I, I, I'm not sure it's a ready-made, but 
let's not. Well, why stick. not? We're here. Yeah. We're here. No, no. You can disagree. No, but I think, but I think the, the issue is that it's an existing work, right? That is, Duchamp stripped his objects of their meaning. They yeah. were, you know, and he didn't do, want to do anything with them. He, they weren't, you know, sort of pulled out of use for exhibition purposes. They were just there to be lived with and basta. And then something else happened to them. Yeah. And then something else mm -hmm. happened to them. But here, the, you know, the work, you know, has a, it has its own presence. And it, you know, was like a work that uh, any of us, say, would do, hoping that it enters history. We hope something about it endures, right? That it keeps its pulse. That it, you know, and Duchamp's ready-made should not have a pulse. All right, but just that I'll just be, you know, like inert. Flavin, maybe not inert. And your work, as it goes forward, not inert, we hope. Um, and so, but the, uh, working with a live element like that puts something also different play. in play in your work. I mean, you've done it before at the America Society, mm -hmm. but to put it in the cave is a different move. Absolutely. Yeah. And it could put too much pressure on Flavin, or it could not. And there's a, you know, there's kind of an energy mm -hmm. but that condition like there, change. right? Or an energy field mm -hmm. that I'm sure you thought about. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Yeah. But what happened after you performed the experiment? Did it? But when you see and Molly, we should answer this question when you see it, because I think it's not the same as the America Society no, piece. Not. It's a completely What's different that? piece, um, Puerto Rican like Cueva I, Vientos. Yeah, well, then, the America Society piece, just so you know, was in a room. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and uh, you know, um, we cannot... Um, but so I, I, We cannot... F f it's not about uh, in any way trying to stand for the intentions of another artist and try to, you know, uh, realize them, how, how, how could one do that? But we think that taking this historical artifact, which is an art object, it is a cultural uh, object, um, and expanding the way in which it can uh, live momentarily by borrowing it, which also is an important point. Right. We really, um, this idea that comes out also in this book and comes out in light of living in Puerto Rico in these days, especially is this question of debt and indebtedness mm -hmm. and borrowing things. And what does it mean to borrow something for a little while and, and live with it in another way and then give it back and then, you know, and then it can return possibly to its other uh, previous life. But I think there's something um, different that goes on in the economy of, yeah. and of borrowing. There's a delicate uh, thing that happens by reciting this work in mm -hmm. a cave in Cueva Vientos in Guayanilla, Puerto Rico. We are uh, dramatically transforming yeah. uh, conceptually, experientially, and politically the work. We are uh, okay. at the same time preserving the original work as it is, but at the same time we're inventing a new work altogether. That is the mm -hmm. relationship between this mm -hmm. series of uh, mm -hmm. yeah, inversions and, and displacements. And Yates and it, said and it's, Yates. We, and it's been, yeah. I guess to a certain degree, you'd have to say its history has been impured by, or we've like sort of, uh, its purity has been uh, compromised by us making it, you know, uh, it's part of its history now, you know, there's no yeah. way that that work can ever not now have what we did but I said, no, but with wait, it. But here's another way to think <laughs> about it, because you also work <laughs> often now with singers. Mm -hmm. right? And maybe the Flavin work functions like a singer being brought. Mm -hmm. But I think Jade, no? I mean, Jade said, said it beautifully in his essay. He's speaking about. Um, how he says it's not easy. He says it's neither a ready-made in the classical sense or the or repurposed industrial object, in parentheses, a model informing Flavin's own work, nor a simple citation of a prior work within the body of another, a new work. Indeed, there will be no there will, there will not be a work at all by Aloren Calzadilla in which the Flavin could be cited, where it is not for Flavin itself, which functions as both artistic inspiration and physical support. So all of a sudden, Flavin's work is no longer just Flavin work. In your work, it's, it's part of your work now, 
converted or supplemented, Jade also uses this term from Derrida, supplemented by your invention. And I think that essay really tries to wrestle with this question in a, in a beautiful way for, for us to accept that this is a new term, that, I, that we have not too many references. I, when I was trying to prepare my piece and trying to look at other artists who have done this, uh, this kind of method or this kind of strategy, uh, Rigrid came into, into play, Rigrid Ravanich, who did another work with Flavin um, in 1998, I think. I can't remember now the exact date. And, um, and Thomas Hirschen, who used an Otto Frulich sculpture in his work, that was in 1998. Rigrid was in 1996, I think. And um, we can think of, of very few. I tried to make a small um, timeline of other artists who have inserted the work of of others in their work. And the earliest I could get was um, George Siegel when um, he did in uh, 65 a uh, work with a Mondrian that is currently in MoMA's collection, the portrait of Sydney, Sydney Giannis. And um, for that Mondrian to be exhibited at MoMA has to be exhibited with the George Siegel sculpture. And this is a catch, because I, you can imagine the Museum of Modern Art wants to show the Mondrian <laughs> all the time. But um, this was part of the terms of the acquisition, that the work had to be together. But it's not, I, I mean, I, I will continue. This now is a, an obsession of mine of trying to be, bring together a story of how um, this has happened. But it's a, it was a great surprise when you guys came back to Philippe and I and said, what we want to do is actually to install the Flavin in Puerto Rico um, and this dislocation, sort of repatriation of semantic, one could say semantic repatriation of, of, an, of a work of art, um, reintroducing that work of art to where its title uh, lyrically evokes, even if it was not intentionally. It's, it was a fascinating challenge for us um, that still we're, we got the whole book trying to help us understand. Well, and I and likewise um, brought out in, in I, th so I think in Yates' text also um, was, and it's something that we were thinking about very much, is the, you know, the title of that work and the year 1965 um, immediately brought us to the history of what was happening in Puerto Rico uh, after the Second World War up until that period of time that made, made possible the conditions uh, for which a, a title like that would have even entered into the cosmos of an artist working in Manhattan in that same year. And I think that uh, that for us was a really important um, consideration too, was how um, through this, this, just this name and this date, you can then open up uh, a whole um, universe of, of interconnected forces that are, that are really tangible once you take the lid off of just saying it's the work by this artist and then we can't go any further. It needs to be just those lights in the white gallery. That's it, we can't go any deeper than that. And this, what we try to do with this is say, yeah, let's take the lid off of that layer and allow for all of those other things that are, are at work behind, uh, either intentionally or not, or, or consciously or not, but nevertheless deeply inform the making of, of, of that work and the making of anything, you know, uh, that any kind of cultural production is informed by all these vast networks of, in this case, you know, the history of um, the American presence on the island of Puerto Rico since 1898 and the failed economic policies of the Second World War afterwards, Operation Bootstrap, oh, Operation Bootstrap. and all of the other types of um, economic um, yeah, initiatives that were happening on the island, which then brought about a form of mass migration to New York City, which then in the 1960s, in particular 1965, were um, very uh, much uh, connected with um, the civil rights movement that was happening in the city and the Puerto Rican community in New York particularly uh, played a big role in that um, in that struggle for for rights uh, in the city which Dan Flavor at that moment too was interested in yeah. in Monument yeah as you mentioned in your own essay yeah. and you know the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 um, the Puerto Rican community were very important instrumental in, in uh, making uh, 
sure that the ballots, they couldn't restrict you from being able to vote without, um, you know, the language test. And so there's a, a really, there's a deeper history behind all of this that I think we wanted the, the, this project of ours to angle itself towards and be open towards. And, to and how that history, it's sort of, it's mirroring into our situation today. Mm. Because I remember when we were looking into Operation Boot, Bootstrap and we started to, uh, we encountered the propaganda videos that the United States were making for promoting this. Um, for those of you who don't know, the, the whole agenda of, of Operation Bootstrap was to um, present to Latin American countries an alternative to the Cuban Revolution. You know, to try to indicate that, if, look in Puerto Rico, we have achieved these uh, highways and industries, and there are no more children without shoes, and there's education, and so on. And there was this whole machinery put in place to suggest that um, there, there was this, this is what capitalism can bring to you. Even look, it happened in Puerto Rico, and has proven that it was a myth. It was a complete um, construction, and. And today we are facing a $74 billion debt. And, and actually one of the things to uh, point out is that, you know, we're, we're not, um, this is, I don't think this is a pattern that we're going to repeat. We're certainly going to leave Dan Flavin alone after this. We have no <laughs> other interest, I'm just going to say publicly, in taking on any of his other works. Um, but, uh, and, or that, for that matter, you know, other artists, so don't worry. <laughs> we're not going to go after you. Um, but there is something of the nature of that work, not only its title, that, but like Guillermo mentioned earlier about the way that it's functioning within this uh, energy loop of a circuit and the circuitry, this idea of a, a kind of circuit or a, a kind of, um, uh, uh, what's the word, I'm, I lost my, my, my thought. Um, like Norbert Wiener, um, Cyber. yeah, like a cybernetic kind of thing, a sort of system, a systemic a kind of you know feedback loop type of thing. Mm -hmm. Now I think we were trying to make larger concentric circles of different kinds of feedback loops that can be circled back into this object, which itself is a you know alternating current that's going around in a circuit. So it all made sense for us to to focus in on this object in this way because it lent itself already materially to those kinds of uh, thought processes. Yeah, but light has been part of your work in mm -hmm. other manifestations, so I yeah. felt it was so natural, this um, return to Flavin's work for this particular project, but also it was in the Renaissance Society, Clamor, it was in your piece with Jenny Holzer, it, so it's, it's been part of your work. I mean, but I understand that it, it's a, challenging uh, proposition to borrow someone else's work. Um, the authorship tension was really um, something that challenged, that challenged everything about us. And yeah, who got, who got the power? I'm just, um, yeah. It's another form of electricity. But yes, and tell us, um, so how, when you got the book, um, and now it's been a year since the project has been open. We have one more year ahead of us. Um, it's been incredibly difficult for people to book um, their spots in the project because it's so popular and um, they have to make reserva you have to make reservations in advance if you want to get a spot. Um, what do you see when well, now the book will go to Puerto Rico? What would, you, what would be your desires? Like, do, can we talk about a little bit of fantasizing what this book may do, or how you, you imagine it existing within the project. Have you had a chance to, <laughs> um, to imagine it? I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> monopolize. Guillermo, you should say something. But uh, you know, I remember Guillermo from the outset, he always had the very, you, you, should, you should say this yourself, but like you always talked about <laughs> how you hate getting books of other artists, and it's the whole time about, <laughs> people writing about, you know, how great they are and, and all this, and in the end it's just, it doesn't really become a tool for you. And I know you were really, uh, from the outset, and I, I identify with it too, wanting to make something that is uh, useful for other people, you really, you know, it's a place, it's hopefully in a place of sharing and inspiration, and I think the I majority think of these texts will give that you know, often that uh, a book, when it's done, it feels like the the end of something or mm -hmm. closing or finishing something and I think we were more interested in the idea of a book being the beginning of something 
instead. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. like this is something to think about something else. So it's just the first step into something instead of like mm-hmm. the door that closes a chapter basically mm-hmm. on something. So that was sort of a, you know, a desire, let's just say. And for me, what's exciting too, I mean, the fact, it's a big fact, the fact that this book is also in Spanish and to think about our second partners in this project, which is the land trust who lends us access to this cave uh, para la naturaleza Mm -hmm. and the great team of people that guide the groups when they visit the cave, um, how exciting it will be that they will get a hold of this book and that we will allow them to have access to some of the thinking. Most of them are biologists or are involved in land preservation and have very little to do with art, but yet they've volunteered and worked on this project, also paid, some of them got paid for this, to be the shepherds of your work. Mm -hmm. And um, this will open a dimension that I think will lead us to other conversations that are not just about the visual experience or the artistic experience of visiting the project. Um, so I look forward to when we go in December um, to, to explore that and how we can um, deconstruct this book in the, in the context of land preservation in Puerto Rico and the, and the goals of Para la Naturaleza, who are a very, for me, a very exciting uh, proposition that, that we encounter by chance. Um, during the research of this project? Yeah, I mean, as a conservation group, uh, one of the things that we have to do, and I think this was uh, one of the key moments of the work, was to think of a coexistence of conservation models that normally they don't, they don't meet. Mm-hmm. So, for example, we had to do a speleological study of the cave. So we have to make sure that by inserting a system that doesn't belong there, it will not affect the life, the flora and fauna of that space. At the same time, we have to do a conservation study of the work, the artwork itself, and find a way of pre- while presenting the work there will not affect the life of the work itself. So we have to build a microclimate system. So we have to deal with these different forms of course, conservation of life forms, right? And find a, a way of, uh, of uh, having, this, yeah, having these different time scales, yeah. you know, a 20th century object and a 65 million year old structure Habitat. and life forms or, yeah. or, or materials, f- find an adjacency, find a way of like, you know, a coexistence. Mm. So we've been talking for about an hour. Wow. Mm. Surprisingly, <laughs> that's what my phone says. Um, should we take some questions? Given that I mean, I, I, many of you probably haven't had a chance to <laughs> even flip through this book, um, but maybe you have just general questions on on the top of your head. Um, maybe we can turn the lights a little bit yeah, yeah. so that we can see you. Um, and um, please help us. <laughs> Has anyone here actually been? Wow. Great, you go three. Six people at a time. Yeah. Right? It's very Okay, I'm surprised. That's wonderful. <laughs> okay. It's just pretty, pretty amazing. And just walking up, just walking up to it, going through the forest and seeing the other cave with the bats and the snakes. Yeah. Is that how often does uh, yes. subtropical? How, Trop- how often does the battery? I know I, I saw like the a car battery that powers the light. How often does that have to get changed? And also the the light itself. I walked all the way up to the top. It's covered in bat guano. So I don't I don't think you'll ever get that off. Da- Flavin has a new. Uh, <laughs> Object that was built by the conservation department of the of the Museo de Par- of, the, of Art of Ponce, and we work closely with them actually on 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 making a conservation um, enclosure. So actually, the 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 object, the historic object, is as if it were in uh, you know Dia Beacon, but there's a you know it's sort of like um, a Mars mission type of thing. You know, on the outside there's something else that's um, you know 
keeping the, you know, the, actually the main issue was um, the change in humidity is the main so issue. Micro, micro climate so there's system a system to, be, uh, to keep it, to uh, con- the humidity to keep out. the humidity mm. uh, as it was in a, in, in a normal museum. setting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we have to work with the conservation department to produce such a system, mm. but also have to work with the, uh, follow the requirements of, of, conservation of the report. conservation report from the uh, mm-hmm. to, ma- to be matched, you know. So the so, conservation department from the Museum of Ponce, you know, does regular visits there to check on all of the, the enclosure and the silica that's in, the, in there. And there's a data blogger that is monitoring the humidity levels to ensure no. that it's protected. Yeah. And this is something that I feel like is what makes this not a flavor when it's in this, yeah. in this construction. Because um, when it was shown at the America Society, it was in Flavin's terms, even though there was an intervention of the electricity being produced from a charge from Puerto Rican light coming from Puerto Rico for those batteries, they were still within Flavin's conditions for the yeah, work. The white where cube he, in the white cube conditions, the architecture conditions. And here it's in a in a new condition that it's um, troubling that Well, there's yeah, this question, origin. when does something end and begin? Where does the art, when, is the, when does the artwork, where does it end? Where does it, literally, where does the artwork end and where does it begin? Both in terms of its extension in space, but also in extension of the intentions. Is there a certain point where it's no longer, like you say, it ceases to be the work of the artist? When art is in storage. Mm-hmm. Is art art yeah. when it's in storage? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because it's, but the condition is really the museum condition for works of art that were made for other places. Mm-hmm. But flipped. Absolutely. But flipped. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it's yeah. Malraux's confrontation of metamorphosis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. <laughs> but there is still something, I find, <laughs> there is something that feels very, uh, it's not, doesn't feel uh, spectacular, doesn't feel grand, it just feels as if, someone from the vicinity put some bulbs in there. <laughs> except you if know? you're, no, but except yeah, unless, unless you're, no. No, unless you're, okay, no, what, unless you're, <laughs> unless you're an art world person and you know no, what those course. things mean. Again, that's why it goes like the sign relations, like you know how to read the yeah. sign and you understand that to be an object of 20th yeah. century contemporary art production. Otherwise, yeah, clearly. Except yeah, the but, political but, implications. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but, but even yeah. so, there are the two different mm-hmm. orders of light, right? Mm-hmm. The natural mm-hmm. light, mm-hmm. The fluorescent light, and they interpenetrate in, in a mm. completely dynamic way, right? right? What's it like at night? It's off, off. at night. The, it's it's, off at night? Yeah. yeah, it has like, you know, when the, there's this sort of a logic for of. The bats and yeah. For the bats? Yeah. When the sun rises, you know, like it goes like on, the when the sun sets. Like it's off at yeah. the museum too at night, you know? The mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. the same. Too bad. But there will be a 24 hour museum one day. <laughs> yes, sir. It's been a really interesting discussion, and I congratulate all of you on this book. I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, the question of Flavin, uh, his intentions, and what happens when you borrow a Flavin or displace it, it's really, really interesting. And what an interesting artist to do that to, to choose to do that to. Um, he once said he didn't know why he used electric light. And he describes putting the first lamp on the wall as a kind of epiphany, the diagonal of May 25th as this epiphany, and he just happened and there it is. And so his own intentions are ambiguous. And it seems to me that by radically displacing it to, as, to the extent that you have, that it's no longer a flave and it allows us perhaps to see Flavin again, mm-hmm. uh, to think about Flavin again. It sounds like that's what Molly has done and mm-hmm. the other authors. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, you know what you could say, James, is that it's a second revelation. The potential for a second revelation might be there. Mm-hmm. Not, maybe not for Dan Flavin because He's gone, but um, but it's you know that whole idea of revelation through light um, is kind of what you're driving at, although in a very civilized way. Mm-hmm. Also, there's something yeah, there, there's all those yeah old, very yeah experientially ancient romantic yeah. way of the illumination experientially mm-hmm. something that happens is that because a cave doesn't have uh, square angles. 
right? 90 degree angles, yeah, 45 degree right. angles. When you're experiencing the world, there's a sense of loss, you lose balance. The coordinates of this of the room, they the have space transversal, are, are morphological space, a vault, a gallery space that completely mm -hmm. uh, makes you uh, lose balance, lose your holding in how you are in the here, I mean in the here and now, mm -hmm. then when you're seeing this, yeah. which is very interesting. Well, and, and also the cave actually by the its natural formation, um, it lends something to the this it having a, a actually strong presence, which is that there's um, this kind of um, a little bit like Smithson, like um, you know, a spill of guano that goes down an inclination of like 45 degrees, and then at the top is where this dome is, and we cited the the, the flavor work at the top of this uh, kind of hill, and the visitor uh, arrives just at the lower gallery of this natural space, and that sort of again like monumental angle, that looking up in the distance, and it's up there, back there, coming down towards you, uh, it it has this magic. Um, scale thing that happens and it doesn't look small it actually really holds that space which is immense it's just the volume is enormous but it doesn't come across as like a little thing there in the back it really states its presence and i think it's also the then the the electrical current of the light emanating from within it out just holds the room i mean it really does a it's it, it's impressive it was a, a kind of thing that Kind of like what we found out about this book that if you're reading it like this it looks like you're reading upside down and we didn't intend that to happen but we like that uh -huh. something happened um that we i guess had an intuition towards but it it really just worked in this way that was revelatory and it's eight feet tall yeah it's, it's eight feet tall it, you know it's not huge yeah just a brief question just now when i was listening to you one of the things that i thought was very striking being in the space is that your understanding of light even though this is not a sound piece, it seems to be acoustic, in the sense that the sources of light seem to sort of create some sort of harmony, and there is a sense in which the, the energies coalesce to create something different, and you were talking about how the sensation of the space kind of expands and contracts, and one of the things that happens to you when you're there is you have a very acute sense of your skin because of the humidity and the changing temperature, a very cute sense of the acousmatics of the space because it keeps changing. You hear all this life around you. You even hear the buzz of the piece and also these different sources of light that keep happening. So it is a sort of an event where all these three senses seem to coalesce. And the funny thing, I mean, that's my question to you is that what seems to me in this kind of your later work is that even though you may not be always be working about sound, the paradigm of, of the acoustic seems to permeate your understanding of the space and how you work with it. And I think that's, in the case of the cave, to me, is really, really, um, it's, it's very, um, you really feel it when you're there. So that's I wonder if you could talk you. to it. It seems like once you work with Sam and the way you worked with it, there's no turning back. That's very, true, and we so forgot to mention that's a really important point, is that the, the guano that is filling the whole floor of the cave, well, first of all, the first impression when you get there is you're overcome by the smell, that's for sure, it's very strong. But even that does something to, again, to, um, uh, um, you know, to dis destabilize your normal perceptive modes. You're already in a, in a different space because your normal ways of coming to the same patterns of conclusions are already destabilized by this new uh, input that you have. So already you're kind of thrown off by that. And then, like as uh, Sarah mentioned, the, um, it's filled, uh, with, you know, many feet thick of, of guano, which happens to be a sound-absorbing material. So it has this very incredible, this again, this cathedral-like space is like a, is like a cinema. It's like a theater. It has this, you know, uh, quality of, of holding acoustic. acoustic quality of holding the sound in this very uh, rich way that you then can perceive the most minute. Uh, movements or sounds in that space very clearly are, 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 are perceptible and, and that's yeah, a part of it. Um, and then it makes me think of the text of uh, one of our authors who are here who was uh, talking about um, the architecture of, 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 of caves and uh, this idea that um, that this light is in all these different ways and one of the places that light is is buried within the the organic matter of the cave itself and so in this guano is is buried light too there is light um, that is emanating from within uh, the space of the cave as well as the you know it through this transformation of photosynthesis and other processes that light is is actually present in all in all different forms
And that's perceptible, I think, as you're trying to say, in that ex in the experience of being there. There were all these movements. Uh, first of all, movement of and transference of energy, but then the movement, the human movement of the pilgrimage going there, that felt entirely natural to pair up with the project. Uh, and I had this idea of the portable cave, the cave that is not fixed on a rock that you can actually carry with you. And uh, I found that idea in uh, one of the fellow surrealists of the 1940s and 50s architect, uh, Frederick Kiesler who kept making those endless houses and spaces that actually were portable caves, as he calls them. Um, and there, I think, you'd see cave not as a, first of all, a ready-made or a fixed space, but as a condition. Uh, a condition that actually you live with and then you carry and then you reproduce in all other enclosures that you will ever make. And my question was, uh, how do you imagine the experience of the people who do the pilgrimage uh, after the leave, uh, the cave actually, and Kisler had this idea that you're bringing the light with you, actually, and you're bringing both the cave and the light, its darkness and its uh, light at the same time, in order to refute Plato, first of all. There is no inside or inside, uh, there is no illusion and reality. Uh, you carry that interior with you and there is no threshold. Mm. No. I thank you for that text, by the way. It was really a wonder, a w wonderful. Um, it was wonderful to read and learn about it, and I and I completely, yeah, I'm thankful for it, and I totally um, identify with that idea. And I and I think that is the experience. I mean, you can't once you once you well, like you say. Well, first of all, you, the cave is always within us. The cave is actually, as you mentioned in your article, is all of the natural. It's emanating from you in every direction. It's the sky. It's the the world itself. Is the cave. And the, the skeleton, as you talk about it, or the bones, is the, the dark. Um, and I, I think in the practical experience of going to this cave, the experience is likewise, you, it stays with you. You take it with you. It's you know, part of your, who you are. Also, there's something uh, technical that becomes, it's becoming more of a sequence, that there are 22 different species uh, recorded inside a cave who live kind of the entire lives in the cave. And then adding to that, there is like six visitors that come and experience these species and this set of relations of light, this 20th century object, this site, the 65 million year formation. Then as you go, you walk out, something that, that's one of the reasons why this cave, this, we were looking for uh, this space for like maybe seven to nine years mm -hmm. to find the, the right. And then something really interesting is that uh, there's a series of ecotones on the journey. Uh, an ecotone is basically is uh, different ecologies that exist in tension. When the different ecologies meet, that moment when they meet, that's what an ecotone is. It's 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 called. And walking that it takes around 30 to 45 minutes, you pass to three different ecotones. And the interesting thing is that in these ecotones, there's these forms of life that only exists in living those moments, in that sort of threshold. Mm -hmm. And that is something very, uh, I think, yeah. it's sort of, yeah, you start to feel the whole idea of displacement and dislocation and networks as you're going towards it, it's sort of slowly announcing themselves or you're becoming in tune with it slowly, so. And then again, there's again that mu musical metaphor that is, um, it is running through our work. I think there is a deep investigation. Ultimately, we are the, the base level the quantum level <laughs> of this, uh, you know, electromagnetic field, this unified field, as they would call it in physics, that is so somehow um, manifesting itself in these different uh, particularities of these experiences and these and how they manifest themselves in these different shapes and forms, and then where they intersect and can make you can make connections between them. And yeah, it was so telling when we were doing the field work, going back to the cave in preparation, which took us about three or four years to get this going and how we were always so fascinated of how different it looked even though Puerto Rico has no seasons um, it's the same weather all year round we were always encountering a very different landscape every time we were there and live in, 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 in yeah but not like in the United States um, <laughs> with the winter and um, I remember thinking 
wow, this is like us going to see art. When you go to the museum and even though you're familiar with the work of art, you're always feeling that you're encountering it again and that you miss something, that there was something that at that moment that we, you were in front of the work, it's no longer the same as you were before. And, I, and how that return was so important also in the experience. Uh, I wonder if some of our visitors are coming back, and for sure the, the guides who are taking the groups, it will be so interesting to talk to them about this return because it's, uh, for me, it was different while we were preparing for it and no, when we were and, installing. And, and this is something, I mean, this is what it feels like the cave as a time capsule or a time machine is that us, uh, we have gone many times <laughs> <laughs> and keep on, keep on going. And as you go in different uh, months of the year, you can see the path of the sun completely changing. You know, like in September, like, you know, which when we opened the work was in the autumn equinox. So it enters right in the middle and it moves in a certain way. As time is starting to pass, you're starting to have this sort of relationship that is larger, right? Like scales of time and, and distance. And you're seeing, you know, the sun completely now entering through the main entrance and no longer uh, from the, optum, the oculus. So as you go back, you're seeing uh, light you know, entering, you know, the thresholds of light entering the cave completely changing. So you have a sense of more like, I guess, like a cosmic sense of, of light and, and the planet and motion, things like that, which is, uh, they're like, maybe no seasons, but it's, uh, in a way, you could see through the sun itself, uh, manifest a uh, pass of time, months of the year passing, like a solar calendar of sorts. I may just f like final, finish by also saying that uh, complimenting or being, uh, saying the, the other side of the, um, the project is there's this obvious experiential lived moment, uh, experience of the work, but I think uh, this book is also equally um, the other side of it, this thought experiment, this conceptual um, frame that to me is, is also what the work is. It's this and all of the different kinds of other uh, experiences that are mental maybe and that are conceptual that um, also are derived from this Puerto Rican light that we uh, have lodged out there <laughs> into our actuality, our right now, our flash between the lighthouse. That's right. <laughs> oh, Amy. Um, I had two questions. One is very simple, which is, what is the duration of the project? And is there an idea that it becomes almost like one of the DIA sites that gets taken care of in perpetuity? Um, or does the work come back, meaning the Flavin work, and then your work disassembled? And then my second question, which is a little more complicated, um, has to do with, you spoke really eloquently about the circuit and the feedback loop. And I'm wondering a bit more about in terms of installing and citing the Flavin and then creating your own work, the things that you've spoken about, many of the things that came about while you were doing it, but I'm wondering about the sort of unofficial narrative. And I guess that comes up for me, you know, in terms of legality, ownership, et cetera. And that comes up, I remember a talk that you gave at MoMA in one of the modern Mondays where you showed like a video that you had put together, but it wasn't an official work. It was a gathering of materials, and I thought it was so sort of idiosyncratic and brave and touching that you would show that. Um, it, but it made me think about all of the, you know, this kind of idea of what you accumulate that sometimes it's actually really awful, but then it gets re-embedded in the work, like the kind of legal problems, et cetera. And I'm wondering, it sounds like in a way this book also encompasses some of that, but I'm sure that there's a lot that's also left out. And I guess I'm wondering about what, not sort of like what are the lurid details, but what are the things that were productive for you that we, you were able to re-embed in the process? Well, the so first are, question, the easy questions. one, I'll, I'll, I'll get that one, <laughs> <laughs> which is, uh, it's uh, two years. It's two years, but uh, mm. so the idea of the work is borrow means that 
it, it needs to return, right? Like that, that it's a, <laughs> so it's a long uh, duration. Uh, however, uh, yeah, there's a, a temporality to it that it's like from equinox of 2015 and then it ends on 2017. Mm -hmm. Then there are questions, I'm not sure I understand well, but you can <laughs> carry on. Well, I feel like there's many questions you were asking in common, so I guess I'm trying to follow the different things you were talking about. I assume the, the video you're talking about is the one about the Ode to Joy that we were showing the history of how that piece of music had been used throughout um, history and how over a period of time actually uh, the opposite, how meaning in a way um, got um, something that maybe in its original formation was meant to, to represent so, a certain idea of, of brotherhood and fraternity and so on through its um, you know, exhaustion by different um, uh, contexts and, and places so disparate in their ideological and historical and cultural um, Difference. differences um, emptied out the meaning of the piece of music so that in the end it in a way can't stand for anything anymore because of the fact that it had stands for so many different things no, so the video the was meant opposite. in a kind of entertaining way we wanted to kind of show that uh, that uh, trajectory or kind of you know musically demonstrate those different uh, occasions of uh, this emptying out of the sign the sign just you know um, it, it lost that specificity that it originally had. Um, and then the second part of your question was how, I don't, I don't know yeah, what you want to know. Is there an equivalent for you in this case with the flaming? Mm. No, it's completely <laughs> different species. I don't know how to answer that either. I don't know, maybe I have to think about it. I'm not sure really how to answer that question. It's a great question, but I, I don't have an answer right now. I'm not, I'm not sure how to compare it. It's to, it was a very different, um, well, I think all yeah, those, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the whole that. research that you have in your bag that yeah. we couldn't publish, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. because this book also had like yeah, I mean, the possibility to. of being two volumes. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah. It's one of the things I got from your there's question. There's all of this that's there's not in the book. <laughs> Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, there's the... Yeah, mm. It's like the idea that you showed something that you never showed Show. as official work. Uh -huh. And then you have this work that you borrowed, mm -hmm. borrowed Yeah. And I'm sure there's a lot that went into that that we don't know about. Yeah. Right. Right. What to make what, public? Yeah. What's the official narrative? What's in the book? Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The you know the this yeah we yeah we edited of course we've yeah. selected the kind of things that we wanted to this particular object to be about and what kind of you know narratives or conversations we wanted this. Uh, you know, this object or this, not even object, this thing to um, generate, you know. So yeah, there's not a talk, there's not a text which we could have done by the, the lawyer from DIA who we worked with about the copyright issues and whether or not we had the legal um, right to make a work like this and if it had any kind of uh, legal ramifications, which we um, found out that it does not. Um, but this was a, obviously a conversation that we did have to uh, have and, and, and really uh, engage with. Um, and I mean, yeah, there's many, yeah, there are many The conservation yeah. report the, on the cave, the conservation oh. report on the Oh, you'll work. notice, I mean, you know, if uh, one of the points and, you know, and, and that's also, also, of course, the object, that's the job of art historians like Molly and others in the future to dig in and, and, and obviously shed light on those subjects that, you know, the artists willfully do you know, deflect the, the conversation around. But, um, you know, I'm open. You guys can talk about anything you want about it, including the fact that you'll see there's never any photograph of the work of Dan Flavin in the book or in any other, uh, you know, media related to this project. And that is precisely for a copyright issue. So we have a legal um, reason why um, that's the case. But in the, at the same time, it's, um, it's also right in a certain way because that work uh, this project, it resists that form of representation anyway. It wouldn't do any justice to the project to have a picture that just sums it up in like one picture. So in a way, that, that gave us the opportunity to uh, allow for, um, yeah, finding other means to um, approximate this experience without reducing it to that one flash of the camera that's going to and forever entomb it in this one particular frame. So, I mean, we're in a way, it was a, I think fortuitous that uh, we don't have that um, uh, right to do so. Yeah, and like the gift I brought you from yeah. Zurich, yeah. Flavin was uh, fond of 
dedicating works to his beloved artists, including Tatlin, but Otto Frulich also, and many others. And um, so, in a way, I guess to maybe answer the question, uh, when you, the experience of being in the cave, one of the things we said, oh, we think he would have liked it. <laughs> I mean, everyone we who are insiders, and also, of course, uh, the head installer at DIA, who worked very closely oh, with him for Jim many Shoffley. years, was, you know, very, uh, comp you know, he, he, he was our biggest and most nervous, uh, you know, uh, visitor for us. We were the most nervous about him because we knew he had such a, you know, intimate relationship to the, those works and, and has been involved in installing them under the optimal conditions as... Dan Flavin, well, you know, has requested them in multiple occasions, and it meant it was very important for us that visit, and it it meant it means a lot to us that he was so happy with it, and and so um, yeah, he even came back more than once to see it. That's how you know how how pleased he was with this. So, you know, that's a, a good thing. Mm. Nothing we can answer. No, <laughs> yeah. All right, we, we have been told that we should go outside and play in the sun. <laughs> Thank you for coming.